Well, we've been talking about the difference. What is the difference that Jesus makes? And, of course, that's kind of been our summer series, and, and there's been a lot of different ideas about the difference that Jesus makes and in our living and in our approach to life. And today we see that Jesus makes a difference in our perspective, in the way we view life, the way we see life. And, and there's a, a story I'll tell at the end which, which shows how, how truth the truth of a situation can make all the difference. If you have the accurate truth, it can truly make a significant difference. And in fact, the practices that we are doing today in COVID will tie into this story that I'll tie into at the very end of our message. But today I want to look at 1 John chapter 1. It's on the back of your bulletin that you received when you came in here. 1 John 1, John the Apostle writes to this churches, probably Ephesus, where we're guessing, where is receiving this letter. And, and he, he writes them to just remind them about Jesus, who Jesus is, the difference he makes, what, what, what kind of a impact Jesus can have. He said, look, we, we saw Jesus. We ate with Jesus. We observed Jesus. We, we saw him die. We saw him rise from the dead. We saw him ascend into heaven. I mean, let me tell you, I'm telling you what I saw, what I witnessed. What, you know, and, and this is the real deal, he says. This, Jesus is the difference maker. And he addresses in this letter of 1 John some people that had a different perspective. They claimed to know Jesus, but there was some incongruency between what they claimed to believe and what they were actually living. It wasn't the same. In verse 5 of 1 John chapter 1, John the apostle, first century companion of Jesus, says, This is the gospel message we have heard from him and announced to you. God is light and in him, there is no darkness at all. He's like, you know, here's, here's the message. Let me, let me tell you what, what we received from Jesus, and, and I'm going to pass it on to you, that God is light. And of course, John loves these pictures of, of light and darkness and life and death, and, and he'll talk about love, and, you know, and, but he says, you know, God is light. And when he talks about God being light, he talks about this, this absolute standard of perfection that God represents. That God is this, this majestic king who, who rules in absolute perfection and glorious majesty. There's none like him. And he's like, look, and, and, and if, 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 if you have anything to do with God, there is no darkness whatsoever with God. There's no darkness. And he uses the strongest term in the Greek possible, a double negative. There's by ne- no means, any way at all possible, any darkness with God. His character is pure and righteous in every way. A couple of years ago, I took my family to the Atlas Coal Mine in Drumheller. And we all got these little helmets with these little lights on them. And we turned the lights on and we all began to kind of do this tour. We saw the top part of the mine and then we began to descend into the shaft of the mine. And we went quite a ways as far as they had excavated. And then they were, we all went, they were explaining the mine. He says, okay, now everybody turn off your light. And we said, we turned off the lights. Click, 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 click. And the last one went off. Click. And then there was this deep darkness. I mean, I, I put my hand right in front of my face. Nothing. Nothing. And in the scripture, the darkness represents life outside of God, away from God. And the world in which we live is, is full of darkness. Jesus entered a world of darkness. And he says, the reality is God is light. There's no darkness in God's character, in the character of Jesus Christ. But we have a problem because there's darkness in us. So how do we relate to this holy and perfect God? And some people want to make up their own rules about this. And there were several that had shown up in this church in Ephesus with, with different ideas about Jesus. And John here is going to address those. And he's going to do it in three, in three ways. He's going to say, look, if this is true, then this. But he says, but if, if, but if, if, but if. So he'll pre- present a possibility, and then he presents an answer to that possibility. So here, here it is. First if is in verse 6. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him, and yet keep on walking in the darkness, we are lying, and we are not practicing the truth. I mean, evidently, these people had shown up and be like, look, look, we are followers of God. We, we, we have a relationship with God. We, we believe in God. Yeah, we're, we're Christians, they might have even said. And, and yet, as you looked at their life, the pattern of behavior in their life did not line up with that statement. You've probably met some people like this in your life. 
people who claim to, to be Christians and, and Christians on their own term. Yeah, God and I have a have our own understanding. We've got this understanding about our relationship and, and I'm good with God and we're, he's good with me and, and we got this all figured out and, and, and you look at their life and there's, there, there's no matching behavior that would indicate to you or to me that they are in fact children of God because children of God will reflect his character in the way they talk, in the way they live, and the way they relate to each other, the way they relate to their community. He's like, here are these people, they're, they're talking the God talk, but they're not walking the God walk. I used to speak at a lot of camps, and, and I, I would address these kids that were camp Christians, right? They would come every week, kind of have a, 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 some, some type of conversion experience at camp, act very spiritual, and then they'd go back to Provo, so they'd go back to Macklin, they'd go back to Wainwright or wherever they were from, and, and, and they, were, they, they would just forget that they had actually done something like this during the summer. And, and I was like, look, you can't just be like a, a one-week Christian. It doesn't work that way. If you make a decision to follow Jesus, then, then you take that decision back with you to Provost. And here in Lloyd Minster, you take that decision to the Comprehensive High School, to Holy Rosary, to Bishop Lloyd, to Rendell Park. You take that decision to Husky Office Building. You take that decision to the shop or to the place where you, you service your car and the, and the shopping store where you buy your groceries. You, that, that comes with you, and, and, and that light is reflected in the way in which you live your life. But here these people were saying, okay, yeah, we're, we're believers in God, but it wasn't matching it. And he's like, look, these people, he says, they're lying. They're not practicing the truth. But then he says in verse 7, that but if. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, the problem is, how do we walk in the light when we have this sin issue? But he says, look, if you walk in the light, and as Jesus is in the light, and you follow Jesus, guess what? You have the forgiveness of your sins. He looks after the darkness that, that you carried before. He forgives you, and he brings you into this relationship where you're walking in closeness with him. It's a wonderful possibility, and it makes all the difference when you walk in the light. If you claim to know God and have a relationship with him to be a Christian, if you want to use that term, then you're going to walk with Jesus in this daily relationship. You know, this idea of fellowship that he talks about in verse 6 is this, it's an intimate relationship. It's a close, it's a, it's a relationship of mutual interdependence. If you claim to know God, then, then, you, you, then you know Jesus. And if you know Jesus, then you walk with Jesus. And then that's a daily ritual and practice that it finds expression in all of your facets of your life. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have this fellowship with one another. You join this family. And the reason John introduces this now is because later on he's going to tell these people, look, if you claim to know God, then you're going to love God's children. If you hate other Christians, you don't know God because God is love. And so he, he's beginning to see that thought right at the very beginning here. But the reality is, when you come to know Jesus, you enter this big family. We talked about that the first week of the difference, the relational difference. You, be, you go from being an orphan to being a beloved son and daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You have fellowship with one another and you discover this cleansing from your sin. But then, then there's another if that comes up here in verse 8. He says, if we say we do not bear the guilt of sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. There's a lot of people that will say, that, no, I don't have a sin problem. I'm okay. I mean, I've never murdered anyone. I've never committed adultery. I've never robbed a bank. I've never, I mean, you go through your list. I mean, a lot of people like God, they like Jesus, they like this idea of even church, but they don't want to admit that they got a problem. And John says, look, you, you, the reality is, if, if you don't admit it, then, then you're wrong, and you're, you're, you're deceived, and, and the truth is not in you. You're deluding yourself. You've missed the point. If you don't admit that you've got a problem. I don't know if you're familiar with the 12-step program of any addiction program. I mean, one of the first things is you got to admit you got a problem. You can't really get to the solution until you first of all admit you got a problem. And that comes right out of the Bible because he says, look, you got to admit that you have a problem. You have, you have this guilty complex because you have sin in your life, but, but Jesus came to, to deal with that problem for you. If we say we do not bear the guilt of sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. But look at verse 9, the but if. But if... We confess our sins. He's faithful and righteous, forgiving us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. But if we confess them, 
to confess your sins is to agree with God about your condition. It's to say, God, I, I understand that you think this is wrong, and I agree with you that when I'm selfish, that's wrong. When I lie to protect myself, that's wrong. When I go towards addictive behaviors to deal with the pain in my life, that's wrong. When I do that binge shopping online because in that moment I just get a release from the the stress of life, that's wrong. When I'm accessing that pornography at night to to soothe my, my soul, that's wrong. When I come home and selfishly don't serve my family and help them out even though I've had a hard day at work, that's wrong. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on and on. He says, I agree with you, Lord. Yes, I, 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 I choose the dark path, but now I'm, I'm choosing the path of light. If we confess our sins, guess what? He's faithful. And the, God's faithful means his consistent character. And as you read through the Bible, what you discover, God is gracious, he's merciful, and he's loving. And even when we mess up, when we confess it, he's like, yeah, okay, based on my character, I'm willing to forgive you. And he says he's righteous, that he's just and fair and equitable. And he says, yes. I will forgive your sin on the basis of what my son Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, and we are forgiven. That is, God lets it go. It, it means to release. It's like opening up you know, the cage and letting those doves fly away. They're gone. It's like the water that passes under the bridge. You can't go back and, and bring it back. It's gone. God, God, God lets it go. And it says he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You're like, man, some of you, I, I know, and even for me at times, when, when you think about your sin, you think, man, I feel so dirty, so unclean, so impure, so, so unrighteous. But it says you're, you're cleansed from all unrighteousness when you confess it, when you come to Jesus, when you acknowledge what you've done and you agree with him, he is willing to forgive it. It says in verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You see, some of these people thought, well, okay, I, I came to faith in Jesus Christ and I'm good. I've never sinned. I will never sin again because now Jesus has forgiven me and it's all over. I don't ever make any more mistakes. And, and John's like, no, no, that's not the way it works. You all know that you have messed up and you continue to mess up. And, and the reality is we need Jesus every day. We need his grace every day. We do get better, but we still don't eradicate it till the final day. But, but, but some people are like, no, no, I, I've come to the cross once and it's done. I'm now living the perfect life. There were churches that used to teach this, even in Canada. This idea of sinless perfection, it's not in, found in the Bible, but churches had manuals where they said, yeah, this is possible. It's not possible. John's like, no, 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 that's not possible. He says in verse, chapter, verse 1 of chapter 2, my little children, I'm writing these things so you may not sin. But, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but for the whole world. So the reality is, when we do sin, we have this advocate. This is like a legal term. It's this legal aid that comes alongside, and he, he pleads our case. And he says, yes, Father, he did mess up. Mike blew it. He yelled at his kids. <laughs> he said a bad word when he was driving in Lloyd Minster, and that person cut him off. But he confessed it to me, and I want you to forgive him. And God says, okay, I'll forgive him. Because, son, Jesus Christ, you asked me to. Because we have an advocate in heaven. You see, the truth makes all the difference. We can't deny the truth. The truth is we have a sin problem. The truth is Jesus came to make a difference in that problem, with that problem. In the mid-1800s, there was a man named Ignace, Ignace Simmelweis. He was a Hungarian doctor who worked in Vienna. Ignaz worked in the obstetric field in the maternal ward and delivered babies. And he was disturbed because there was a problem in their hospital. The, about 13 to 18% of the women died of this childbed fever after giving birth. It was very high. And what, what was odd about this, I mean, in, in, you know, mortality was, was, was not all that uncommon, was that there was another war just down the, down, down the hall that was staffed purely by, by these, um, these women that help you deliver babies. What are, you, what are they called again? Yeah, there we go. All right. Yeah, those, those women, you know, not doctors. And of course, doctors kind of look down on them. But only 2% of those women would die of this, of this 
childbed fever. And so he's like, how come the women don't die there, but the women die here? This doesn't make any sense. Why is this going on? So he began to investigate. Perhaps it was the, the climatology of the room, the crowding of the room. He looked into all the factors. And the only thing that it came down to was that these women were delivering these babies and the doctors were delivering the babies here. He's like, okay, so, so how, how do we solve this problem? Well, one of his fellow doctors was performing an autopsy and cut himself with a scalpel. Got sick. The symptomology was exactly the same as childbed fever, and he died. And they're like, okay, well, this is odd. I mean, you know, you know so, so, so he's not pregnant, obviously, but he had died of the same thing as these women. He began to investigate, and he realized, oh, this is what's been going on. These doctors were performing autopsies and then they would go over and deliver babies. Cutting dead bodies and then go over and deliver babies. Do, do, do you get it? And so Ignaz Semmelweis said, okay, look, from now on, everybody, when you've been doing this, before you go in to do this, deliver babies, you stop here at this chlorinated lime solution and wash your hands and then go in and deliver the babies. Would you believe within two months, the mortality rate fell to 2% all across the board. Ignaz Simmelweis had discovered something remarkable. But the medical community refused to acknowledge it. Because they couldn't explain it. Why does this, why does this make a difference? There, there, was no, there was no science behind it except that wh whatever, when they changed the behavior, it changed the result. But they said, we, we can't explain it. We, our germ theory is not that developed. And, and, and he struggled and struggled. And, and of course, the doctors didn't want to admit that they were responsible for these women's death. And so it, it caused all sorts of problems, even internally for this man. He eventually got committed to an insane asylum and died at, in his 40s. And not till after his death would people finally, other researchers were like, yeah, he was totally right. Germs are carried on your hands. And by simply washing your hands, the truth of that can change and save lives. The truth of what John is presenting here in, in his letter to us today is that, you know what? Jesus Christ can make a difference with our sin problem. And it's up to us to whether, whether we want to accept that truth and, and discover life or, or reject it and, and, and keep living in, in, our, in our own darkness. I mean, it was, it was a life-changing, life-altering discovery that today you guys have, many, all of you used hand sanitizer, washed your hands today, I hope. You know, you, know you, you went to the bathroom, you washed your hands, you picked your nose, you washed your hands, I hope. You, know, I don't know, you did all these things. You know, you, you're doing this because Ignaz Simmelweis discovered this. And, and here Jesus Christ came. And the truth is that he can make a difference when we believe in him. That we can have our sins forgiven and be cleansed and be declared unrighteous because of him. You see, some people think that Jesus is just a great teacher, a great example. All the world religions love Jesus' teachings, but the, the truth of the matter that John wants you and I to... Jesus' death on the cross was so important it's the atoning sacrifice, he says in verse 2 of chapter 2. The atoning sacrifice. It's the, it's the payment to, to, for sin once and for all. And, and, and without his, I mean, if, if, Je, if we didn't have a sin problem, Jesus didn't need to die. But Jesus died so that we could be forgiven and welcomed into a relationship with him. It makes all the difference. And that difference really is only appreciated when you believe the truth and then walk in it. Semmelweis could present his thesis, but it didn't really apply to you until you took, a, took the soap and began to wash your hands before you went into, into the delivery room. Jesus is like, you can talk about me all you want, but until you really believe in me and receive me and surrender to me and begin to walk in the light with me, this doesn't make any difference. But it can make all the difference. As we walk in the light and we discover fellowship with one another. You know, I've never known a married couple to get divorced who are both walking in the light. Never. Who are passionately pursuing Jesus together because what happens is it actually draws you closer together. I, I've never known a church to blow up that, that where, where all of its members were passionately pursuing Jesus. You see, when there's one common goal, it brings us together. 
This is what John is saying. Look, look, when you just keep Jesus in the front, forefront, man, it has a way of just unifying us. We might not agree about COVID. We probably don't. We might not agree about the use of masks and where we should use them and when we should use them. We might not agree about social distance. We probably don't. But we can agree about this, I think. Jesus Christ makes all the difference. And there's some wonderful promises here that John invites us to appreciate and believe and experience in our own life. And it will make the difference. It's a change of perspective. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Have faith in him and walk with him today. Would you pray with me as we close, team, and come up, and they're going to lead us in a final song. And If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I invite you to do so today. If you're watching online, you've never believed in Jesus Christ today, God is inviting you to become part of his forever family. You can do that even where you're sitting, wherever you're watching this, where even those, those of you in this parking lot right now, God invites you to become part of his forever family through faith in Jesus Christ who died for you and rose again. And for the rest of us, it's like, what is the difference that Jesus is making? Are we walking in the light? Dear God, help us to walk in the light, to walk in a close relationship with Jesus Christ, to experience the transformational difference that you make in our life day by day. When you bring sin to our mind, may we confess it and find forgiveness. May we discover the joy of obedience and closeness of relationship with you. May we discover the joy of fellowship with one another. I pray that even in the uncertain times that you would strengthen marriages as they focus on Jesus, strengthen families, and strengthen our church family as we focus on Jesus, even in these times in which we're living. And may Jesus make all the difference for us. We pray this in his name.